So I'm Shmuel Hain. I teach um, a little bit at YCT. Um, I've been teaching some Avelut, Hilchot Avelut there for a number of years, and this year I'm trying to teach a little bit more there, um, some Chaburot, but I don't know the Maharat students so well, so this is a nice opportunity for me. And um, I also teach at SAR High School, and Rabbi Helfgott always asks me to teach something at the Yomi Yun, and I'm always like, no, I got too many things going on, or it's not convenient. But um, I said this year I'd be willing to do it because I was on sabbatical last year, and I had some free time, but didn't realize that I would no longer be on sabbatical when, <laughs> when, when I would be actually giving this. So um, this is kind of a, um, a practice run for the Shabbat Shuva Drasha that I'm doing in my shul. Because in addition to the teaching um, that I do, I also, oh, this is an old copy. Okay, well, we'll work with it. Um, in addition to the teaching that I do, I also have a synagogue up in North Riverdale. Um, and long story short, we were planning on having like our opening of our new renovated shul for the Yom Norayim, but we're going to be a little bit delayed. So I had, th- I had thought the topic of Hakel, um, it's Parshat Vayelech, which is Shabbat Shuva, and it was like thematically appropriate. And this is a year when there would be Hakel, you know, they're going to do something in Israel about that. So I thought that would be a nice connection. Hi, Liz. How are you? Hi. Thank you. And uh, so it, it hasn't all worked out exactly as I had hoped. Um, but it gave me a really good opportunity over the summer to do some research into Hakel that I had never done. And I, I told Rabbi Helfgott that this, this is less Tanakh and maybe more um, Chazal in its focus. Um, so if you're okay with that, I'm okay, I'm okay with that. And um, what I'd like to try to do is uh, try, to, try to identify some of the different uh, ways in which this uh, ceremony was understood throughout, uh, throughout Jewish history, throughout Tanakh, and, uh, and in Chazal as well. So our topic is, is Hakel. I, I, I called it two Tanaitic takes on Hakel because um, that's one point that I think is really in, will be interesting is that there's like a divergence of views on, on what was read, and based on what was read, we can perhaps kind of um, work backwards to figure out what the purpose of the ceremony uh, was or is. So let's take a look at the psukim first. Um, And then we're going to look at the way the Mishnah understood these psukim or interpreted these psukim. Then I want to take a look at some of the proto-hakels that appear in Tanakh. And then we'll, we'll kind of get to the different takes um, in the Tanaim. And finally, if we have some time at the end, just kind of summarize and takeaways, uh, looking at what are the different themes that, that emerge from kind of an overview of these sources. OK? I'm going to try to do all What would you say? Didn't Yehoshua do Hakel? I don't know. came into the I don't, something where they read the, um, off the stones, like that. Right. So but, that, but I don't have that topic. I don't, I don't yeah, that, the, the, the ones that are, are most often, the, the narratives in Tanakh most often associated with Hakel are, are Yoshiahu and Ezra Nehemiah. Oh, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I hadn't even, I, 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 yeah, I guess. I think those are the, the Karlot and the... Right, that's more of a replay of Kita, of the, you know, Har Grizim and Har Ev. That, that's more of that, um, but that's a fair question. What is your name? Uh, Leah. Hi, Leah. Hi. Where, what are you up to in life? We all introduce ourselves. Yeah. Um, third year. Uh, okay. Uh, Yeshiva at Maharaj. Great. All right, nice to, nice to meet you. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at these psukim and uh, figure out what we know and what we don't know from the, from the psukim. So Moses wrote this Torah. Now, that's 
that's a bit ambiguous what what exactly this Torah was. You know, is it the five books of Moses? Is it Sefer Dvarim? Is it is it something else? Um, it's not entirely clear uh, at all. Um, but he wrote something down and gave it to the priests um, who typically carried the, the Aron, Brit Hashem, and he gave it to the elders of Israel, and then he commands them, Aitzav Moshe Otam Leimor, Miketz Sheva Shanim, Bemoed Shnat Hashmita, Bechag Hasukot, Bevo Chol Yisrael Leirot, Et Pnei Hashem Alokech, Bamakom Asher Yivchar, Tikrat HaTorah Hazot, Neged Kol Yisrael, Boaz Nehem. Moshe commands them at the, at Miketz Sheva Shanim, at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, uh, at the Feast of the Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which God chooses, you shall read this Torah before all Israel in their ears. Okay. The exact timing of this ceremony is very interesting and subject to a lot of discussion. Uh, it hinges on what Miketz Sheva Shanim means. Does that mean at the end of the seven-year cycle or meaning in the last year of the seven-year cycle or after the conclusion of that seven-year cycle? There's one other parsha in the Torah that has the same confusion or amb- amb- ambiguity. That's, that's the Shemitat Ksafim in Re'e. And so there's the, those two parshiot kind of uh, are, are parallels, and there's a whole lot of discussion about whether they're seventh year or eighth year. The consensus when it comes to both of them is that their miketz is to be understood at the end, you know, following the seven years, meaning before the eighth year. Yeah. Is there a significance? I mean, this has to do with like what is hakel in the first place, but like, is there a significance to it? Having been read before Shemitah versus I think so. I think that that would be a big, that's why I mentioned, I, I mean, it's not just the academic question of was it a seven year, seventh year ceremony or an eighth year ceremony, but presumably that question yields potentially different emphases for, for Hakel. Is it a post Shemitah thing or is it a, you know, the beginning of, of Shemitah? And that's also a big question with Shemitah Ksafim. I'm, I'm, we're not going to have time to get into all of that, but I, I want to bracket it just because I think it's an important question, an interesting question, and worthy of further discussion. Yes, Leah. So I immediately I thought of Sukkot as being hecha, the simcha. Is there a significance in the Farsi? Like, what, we would we would expect that there. It, it's a little bit verbose in how it identifies the exact timing. So we're going to also see that there's some discussion about when exactly, seventh year, eighth year, we've already talked about. Now within that Sukkot season, when exactly are we talking about? There, there are two different uh, girsot in the Mishnah. One as it appears in the Bavli and one as it appears in the Yerushalmi, and that reflects different kitveyad. Um, about when exactly this ceremony took place. Just it, sorry, one question. Yeah. On the Miketz Shabbat Shemit, isn't it that um, Shemitah Ksafim is at the end of the seventh year and then this is the beginning of the eighth? Right, so that's how it's typically understood. But then the same word is just like where... Right, it, it's the same question, meaning... Uh, but it doesn't, like the same rule doesn't apply, like you learn it out differently. No, it, it would probably be the same, it's the same phrase. Uh, it's the same word, miketz. So what, however you, you explain it in one context, you would, you would probably be consistent and explain it the same way here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm now, my head is in prusbal now because before the eighth year, I'm helping congregants write out prusbals if they want to collect debts that have not been returned. That's like, this is the season to do it. So happy. Yeah, but, but if you're Chabad, um, you actually did a prusbal last year. They, they follow the opinion of the Rush that, that Miketz actually could mean either the beginning of the seventh year or the beginning of the eighth year. So they actually follow the view that you can't collect a loan without a prusbal during the seventh year. 
even though the loan is not yet nullified until the beginning of the eighth year. They split the collection prohibition from the nullification. Um, so I think Chabadniks actually do principles twice, once before the seventh, the Shemitah year, and once before the eighth year. Uh, so that's where my head is at, but it's a similar kind of question um, would play out here. And this all has to do with kind of things which are associated, associated or adjacent to Shemitah, but not necessarily inherently connected with the Shemitah of the land. Um, okay. So the, the psukim continue, and here's where we get the name of the ceremony from. Hakel ta'am ha'anashim v'hanashim v'hataf v'gercha asher v'sharecha leman yishmu'u leman yilmidu v'yaru et Hashem elokeichem v'sharmu v'asot kol divrei ha'torah azot. Gather the people. And this, this ceremony is the, you know, probably the only fully egalitarian ceremony we got in uh, biblical Judaism. Gather the people, um, all the people, and that includes men and women and taf and strangers and all, everyone is, is welcome, uh, so that they may hear, laman yishmu, laman yilmedu, and so that they may learn, viyaruet Hashem. So we have hearing, learning, fearing, vishamru, uh, and observing, and their children, who don't know it, This Pasuk seems a little bit unnecessary because the previous Pasuk had kind of included this part about hearing and learning and fearing. Um, but there, the, the Pasuk Yigimel seems to be emphasizing the idea that, that this is not, this is an in, a purposefully intergenerational ceremony. It's not, it, it's about even the children who, who, who don't yet know and haven't yet um, heard and, and listened and, and learned. It seems to emphasize Adama too. Yes, there's definitely an emphasis or that Pasuk connecting it with the land and, and passing, crossing the Jordan to possess it. So if I were to just ask, what's, what's this ceremony uh, primarily about? Um, what would you say? What's well, like the main idea of Hakel? Yeah. It feels a little like Karsinai. Everybody's together and you're, it's like you're, you're receiving the Torah again or you're affirming your, your Good. Your yeah. So the hakel, even that that shoresh, that verb, has Sinaitic echoes, and and certainly suggests that there's some kind of renewal of the covenant, or rededication of the covenant, or uh, an exper- a re-experiencing of of Har Sinai. Good. Who who's who's reading the Torah? According to these psukim, whatever the Torah is and whatever is supposed to be read, who does that? Did the psukim tell us that? They do not. Okay. What else? What else do we not know from the psukim? What do we know from the psukim? What do we not know from the psukim? Anything else that you're curious about in reading this, and we can see how how the Mishnah kind of distills some of the. Uh, rabbinic interpretation of this of this parsha. I guess I would be curious, like the first um, in your bet when it sort of could seem like the Ishmael and Wilma do the year is like for the sake of last soat. Like it's almost like you have to be reminded of it so that you do it, um, which like kind of I feel like m- makes sense. And like kind of a renewed commitment, but then it's just interesting that the next the drops the last so the last so which like if anything I would if you only had till you'd bet I'd be like oh the point of it is to last so and those are the way the, the ABCs or like, I love it maybe there's something about the children who are not yet obligated to do right. in Yud Gimel yeah, that maybe the point is not, there's like a value in the educational process right before they're even ready to do 
I like that. Oh, the other thing that I think is interesting, I didn't notice until we were just reading this now, is like there's an inversion of na sevenishma in that pasuk. Like if we're going back to the Sinai uh, model, there B'nai Yisrael were all na sevenishma, and here it's the first thing they need to do is hear and learn and and fear, and then they'll do. So that that might be a function of just the different context and like it not being the theophany and the revelation, you know, or, or I'm not sure, but I think it's noteworthy, especially once we've, we've identified some of the literary parallels to Harsinai, that in that sense, the Nase, the, the La'asot seems to be the ultimate goal and is also after the other stuff is in specifically the Yishmu. Okay, anything else? Like I said, this is a work in progress. Why only every seven Yeah. Years? Like, shouldn't we do this every Shavuot? Or yeah. I, I, yeah, it's a good question. But, so that, that seems to suggest, like, there is something about the Shemitah cycle, um, but it also might be, like, it's hard to pull it off every year, you know? I, I, it, it's... And it may it may lose its 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 potency if you do it every year. I always think as we head into Rosh Hashanah, like Alenu, Alenu is like the most powerful, beautiful like <laughs> prayer, and it's ruined because we like say it three times a day and and took this tefillah that was like for Rosh Hashanah, then probably was extended to Yom Kippur, and then everyone was like, "This is the greatest prayer ever. Let, we should say it all the time." And now it's been kind of, you know, we've been desensitized to its, to its power and, and its, its beauty. And I think that, you know, seven, seven seems to be the cycle of things. And it may be that that's the, you know, the, the Goldilocks of, of just being exactly right, of not too frequently, but not too, you know, every 50, every Yovel, it would be maybe... Too, too, too long. You miss a lot of people's lifetimes, you know, given life expectancy in those days. Yeah. I was just thinking, you said the power of the Lenu. I was thinking uh, the word power, the power of the people. Yeah. Like, you know, you think about uh, Sukkot, when everybody goes to the Kotel. Right. And, right. So this is, that. yeah, they, yeah. this year they're going to do it. I think they do the Birkat Kohanim on the first day of Cholomoid Sukkot at the Kotel. They do like a big Birkat Kohanim. And they're going to do, they're going to, whatever, hockey, I don't know if, some years. What would you say? What we'll, we'll, we'll go through with the mission, but and I don't remember. I think there have been times where the president of Israel was Dati, where they had him do it. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not totally sure. It, it, it does, yeah, you know, when, when, yeah. There's a whole history. You could write an academic article on the history of you know the revived Hakel since yeah. the modern state of Israel. It's fascinating, and what every seven years what they've tried to do in it. Like you can write that alongside the the shemitah, you know the the hetermechira fights. Every you know, oh, yeah, that's a good the, the hetermechira one is a little bit more intense. This one, it's the stakes are are lower. Okay, so the Mishnah um, distills some of the strands of interpretation and answers some questions, um, and then we'll we'll kind of figure out where where we get some of the the things from. So the the seventh parak of Sota is one of the most fascinating prakim um, to kind of just fall upon because it has a, a, a motley crew of different uh, rituals and ceremonies um, which are recited in B'chol Hashon versus B'lashon HaKodesh. So this Mishnah, Mishnah Aleph in the parak uh, delineates those things which can be said in any language, which includes Kriyat Shema and Tefillah, and vidui um, ma'as wrote just to take the you know this past week's parsha, and for whatever reason, there's a, then a list of those things which can only be recited in in um, in Hebrew. The hook, the reason why it's here is parshat sota is on that first list. Elu nemar and bechol hashon sota is one of the things that can be said in any language. So here are the things that need to be said in. In Hebrew, Elun Amarim Bilashon Kodesh, Mikra Bikurim, Chalitza, Brachu to Klalot. That's a weird thing, Brachu to Klalot, because it was only said one time, and it's not clear exactly why the Mishnah is referencing that. 
Birkat Kohanim or Birkat Kohen Gadol. Anybody have any idea what Birkat Kohen Gadol was? Yeah, it's described in Masechet Yoma. What's interesting about Birkat Kohen Gadol is it's nowhere in the Torah. Like if you look at the, the Parsha of the Avodah of Yom Kippur, it doesn't ever say that the Kohen Gadol was supposed to like say a bracha. But the Mishnah has a whole elaborate ceremony where the Kohen Gadol says a litany of brachot on that day. And he reads from portions of the Torah. Also, Allah Hakel. So it's, it's like, it's the, par- it's, the, it's the ceremony most parallel to uh, the one that we're discussing, uh, Hakel. Um, just keep an eye on the time. Um, and here's, here's, and then the Mishnah continues, Uparshat HaMelech. So that's an interesting phrase. That is understood to be a reference to Hakel, the Parsha of the king. Okay? Is that, what, is, what could that mean? Parsha Tamelech. Yeah. Um, I think it's in Parsha Shoki. It says that the king is supposed to write a safer Torah. So. Okay, so there's the portion of the king. I think the straightforward reading is Parsha Tamelech means the Parsha which discusses the king. Right? That's like Uparshat Egla Arufa is the Parsha which describes the, the ritual ceremony of Egla Arufa. What's the other way to understand Parsha HaMelech? Not necessarily the Parsha that describes the limits and the, and the laws related to the king, but the Parsha that the king reads. Mm. Right? Birkat Kohen Gadol is the bracha that the Kohen Gadol uh, blesses on Yom Kippur. Parshat Amelch, there's a little bit of ambiguity. I think the straightforward reading is like Sophia said, the, about, it's, it's referencing the actual Parsha of the laws relating to the king. But we're going to see, it could alternatively be, be understood as the, the Parsha, you know, or the portions which the king reads. Okay, and that, that would be the Hakel. If it's the Parsha of the king, Sophia, and that's referring to Hakel, that would suggest that you at the very least have to read that Parsha as part of the, it might be that that's the only Parsha you read, if we, if we understand that kind of very narrowly, which doesn't necessarily fit so well with the Psukim. The Psukim don't immediately follow that Parsha. But could it be like, just like um, the Parsha to Agla Arufa could be the section of Agla Arufa, or it's specifically what they're supposed to say, Agla Arufa, and it's there too, also with the, with the Parsha Tamel there, it says that the king's supposed to write a Sefer Torah, so we should, he should read. From the Sefer Torah he wrote. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that could be. Yeah, because you do have, that's a good point. You do have the fact that the, the, the Melech is supposed to write a Sefer Torah described in that Parsha might then allow us to expand what he reads, that he could read from that. We don't know exactly what was in that Sefer Torah either. Right. It's the same kind of question. Um, it's definitely more riveting than reading about a king. Just the king. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll... we'll, we'll it would imitate, but, I don't know, imitate, but you told uh, Moshe et a Torah. So it, Sophia was saying that right. he writes it, or I guess he's repeating it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, but the king had to have that Sefer Torah with him at all time. But once every seven years, he would read from it right. kind of thing. That's cool. I like that. Okay. So... Um, um, the, there, there was a, a priest who wasn't the Kohen Gadol, but was like a, an alternate who would um, address the nation before the war and tell the people who were scared to stay home, basically. That was, that was the job of the Meshul Chacham. Okay. Later on, beginning with Mishnah Chet, the, the Mishnah describe in detail the Parshat HaMelech. And this is, this is our, like, earliest source for the Hakel, rabbinic source for the Hakel ceremony. Parshat HaMelech Ketzah. So how did this go? Okay, so here I, I have the two gears out. Motzei Yom Tov HaAchron or HaRishon Shel Chag. Right? So this makes a big difference. According to Yerushalmi, which seems to be the, the original Girsa, they didn't read this on, on Sukkot. Bechaga Sukkot means during the season of Sukkot, Bevochol Yisrael. And it actually makes sense. 
halachically speaking, there's a prohibition of, uh, there, there's a requirement of lina. When you went to, when you went on Ali Ala Regal, you were required to stick around for the duration of the Chag. So when would you have the biggest crowd? At the end of Shemini Atzeret. Because that was the time where people, not everyone arrived before the beginning of Sukkot. Some people got there over Cholomoed. Some people came maybe right before Shemini Atzeret. So when do you have the biggest olam built in? Now again, Ali Ala Regal wasn't Anashim Nashim Bataf, but it, it it allowed for more people to be there. So the Yushalmi seems, the Yushalmi's vision of Hakel seems to be actually like Simchas Torah-ish yeah. in the sense that it's the day after Shemini Atzeret when you've got the big crowd already gathered in Jerusalem and now we do this, this tackam. But what's interesting then is it's not necessarily tied with the Simcha of Sukkot and it, it might have a more transitional purpose of like, now that we're going back to our daily routine, and now that we're going back to our work, right, post Shemitah, post Chagim, that, that has kind of an additional, um, adds an, kind of, kind of a, 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 work, a work day routine uh, uh, kind of kickoff feel to it. Does that make sense? When you say post, you mean... After uh, Shemini Atzeret, like, right, okay. right, it would it would be Motzei Yom Tov Achron would be presumably the ninth day uh, of Sukkot, which again they were only observing eight days, not like the diaspora. So people would stick around for one more day for Hakel. And you also had Sukkot Beit Hashoeva. Right, you were having people come in all the nights. Correct. You yeah. <laughs> right. So. Now, the, the Bavli's version of the Mishnah, and all the Rishonim have it as Yom Tov Rishon Shalchad. Uh, and the Bashmini is not clear exactly if that's referring to the eighth day or the eighth year. They make this wooden platform in the temple courtyard. Chazana Knesset not al Sefer Torah, and not the Rosh Knesset. Rosh Knesset not the Laskan, but Laskan not the Kohen Gadol, but Kohen Gadol not the Melech, and Melech Omeidu Mekabel v'Kore Yoshev. It's really interesting. There has to be like a like a whole procession. Procession. That's 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 the right word. We once had um, Hillary Clinton at our seder. It's a long it's a long story. <laughs> tell it afterwards. But I remember when the Secret Service came that morning, there were, the morning before, there were two funny things. One, me and my dad were out in our, in our driveway burning chametz, and the Secret <laughs> Service came and looked at us and were like, what is going on here? Is this going to be a safe place? And then they asked us, um, how large will the greeting party be? And I was like, we were like, it's just our family. <laughs> like, I don't know, they're like, they're going to be like the six of us and like we're having a few other guests. They're like, okay. Uh, you know, but there, there's something about having a procession and having a, this person pass it to that person, this person pass it to that person. I think that might be part of the whole Brit Mila, you know, thing as well. That, you know, we, 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 we want to make it into something bigger. And so we, we have this, this extended procession. Okay. Uh, and so then the coin sits, he, 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 this, the coin stands to receive it, because that's like the proper respect, it sounds like. But then he, he the, the, sorry, the melech, the melech stands to receive it, but then the melech is allowed to, to um, read it while seated. Okay? That's nice. Yeah. yeah. But then there's an interjection. Agrippas ha-melech, king Agrippa, Amad v'kibel v'kara omed. He would st- he stood and received it, and then he read it while remaining standing. V'shibchu chachamim, and the scholars of the time praised him. Ukishihigia lelo tuchal lateta lecha ish nachri zalgui nav demaot. And when he got to the verse. You may not appoint a foreigner over you. He had foreign lineage, Agrippus. Zalguin of Demot. He starts, tears start flowing from his eyes. 
Amrulo, and the, the sages said to him, Al titiare agripas, achinuata, achinuata, achinuata. Super interesting. Yeah. And sad. And sweet. Doesn't Yoshio also cry when he hears the Torah? I mean, that's, he does Hakel eventually. There's a lot of people crying when the Torah is read in Tanakh because it yeah. seems like the Torah has been forgotten every time they... Every time they read the Torah, it's like, oh my gosh, we didn't know any of this stuff. Um, Apparently okay. he was Herod's grandson. Right. Yeah. The standing means entrance. If it's supposed to be like Mamad Harsinai, you think that the standing, that should be mandatory. That's well, the people be. probably have to stand. The question is whether the reader. That's such a weird image, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, is, is the king in place of God? And that's so just to stress that's not the case. He sits down? I don't know. Or maybe. It feels very nonchalant. Yeah. It, it, it's fascinating. It, this whole interjection is fascinating. I read it as they're doing, the Chacham the, the were doing what they thought was the right thing, meaning there's a whole other um, strain of rabbinic thought which criticizes the Chacham for doing this, that they're, that they're falsely, uh, that they're distorting the Torah. Right? Because that they're, he's not actually wrong. Because he's actually not supposed to be doing this. But I actually don't read it like that. Like in the Mishnah itself, I think they were trying to say, no, you're, you're welcome. You're, you know, you know, we don't necessarily know how to understand that particular verse, but it doesn't apply to you. You know, or we're going we're gonna to dismiss that, that for the moment. Would he be the Gericha? Yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Okay, just to finish the Mishnah, and then, and then we'll, we'll take a look survey some of the biblical, some of the biblical um, uh, proto hakels. Vikore mit here's the Mishnah's list of what they read. Vikore mitchilat ele hadvarim ad shma. They will read the first five plus chapters of Dvarim from the beginning until Shema. Vahayim Shamoa, skip to Vahayim Shamoa, Aser ta Aser what we're familiar with, with from Shmini Atzeret. Ki tichalel ha'aser, the, the vidui ma'asrot section. Then there's some grusot that have uparshat ha'melech. Now what's weird about that is they have it here. It's out of order, right? It would be going back. Isn't all of this parshat ha'melech? And isn't this whole thing parshat ha'melech? Mm -hmm. But what's strange is if you take out the parshat ha'melech, which all of the, almost all the variants of the Mishnah do not have it, then what's really strange is how did Agrippus in the previous line get to that Pasuk if, he wasn't, if that wasn't being read? Right? So we're going to see, that's what got me curious in reading the Mish Mishnah. Okay, the, there's a history here. There's a development. There's different views on what was read at Hakel that's emerging from, from this patchwork Mishnah. Okay? And then, until you finish that whole parsha. And the brachot shekoin gadol mevarechotan, amelech mevarechotan, el shenotein shel regalim tachat mechila tavon. Okay, we'll skip that for now. Okay. So, we're going to come back to that did they read the, the portion about the king? Did the king read the portion about the king during Hakel or not? We're going to see that's kind of the, the linchpin of the two different Tanaitic takes. Before we get to that, I just want to show you that I think some of the details of the Mishnah are, are deduced from Hakel-like ceremonies in Tanakh. Okay, because one of the things that's weird about the mission is like the assumption is the king reads this. Where did they get that assumption? So I think they got it from the story of Yoshiahu. Um, we're familiar with that story of Yoshiahu. We know it just because of Tishabab, I think, not because we know Tanakh, at least me. The mission goes on, doesn't it? Like, a, hey, new, like when everyone comes from, where are you from? I'm coming from, like, they're. Each uh, city is welcomed, or I'm mixing it up. I think you're mixing that up with something else. That's not here in the context of Hakel. Okay. Might be Bikurim. Yes, it is. I'm I sorry. think it's Bikurim. 
Okay. No, this is the end of the whole. Tech That's the end of that okay, tech. Yes. Right, yeah. No, no problem. Yeah. It was good. I, I'm, 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 I'm a big fan of the Mishnayot Bikurim and the Bikurim ceremony. Yeah. So I, it's all good. Um, okay. So in the, the story of Yoshio is this um, kind of semi-tragic story. At least on Tishabov it is because he initiated this whole. He was the. Grand, he was the, who, what's the lineage? I always Menashe. forget. Yeah, Menashe was his father or grandfather? Grandfather. grandfather. So he had some really terrible, uh, you know, predecessors. And he becomes king at a super young age and seems to not know anything. And like, everything's been forgotten. It's wild. And um, they discover a Torah. Right. They, yeah, right. They discover a Torah and it's like, wow, holy cow. We found this Torah. <laughs> And um, we pick up with Parakhov Gimel. The, the story is told a little differently in Divrei Yamim, as are all these stories. So I'm choosing this version just because it has more relevant details for, for our proto hakeling of this story. Yeah. So, Vayishlach HaMelech Vayasfu Elav Kol Ziknei Yudav Yerushalayim Vayal HaMelech Beit Hashem V'chol Ish Yehuda V'chol Yoshri Yerushalayim Mito V'akohanim V'anivim V'chol Ha'am so they found something called the Sefer Habrit, the Book of the Covenant. And they, he read, it sounds like Yoshiahu reads this. The previous paragraph it sounds like somebody else read something. But here, this is Yoshiahu reading the Sefer Habrit in front of everybody. This doesn't sound like it's at the time of Hakel, though. Meaning this is not like post Shemitah. Uh, around the Chag Sukkot. It, it, we don't have an a- exact date. How would they have known to that's right, right, right. They right, right. They didn't, but that's why it's a proto Hakel, meaning the yeah. idea is they're doing something right. like Hakel um, without much knowledge of, of what it exactly is. It's also not the, it's not the Sefer that they found in the Beit HaMikdash. It's like it's its own thing. The Sefer Abrid is a separate text. Yeah, I think it's the Torah Moshe. In, that they found in Chafbet. Yeah, okay, thanks, Sophia. Yeah, so I, they, they, you have to look carefully at Perichov Bet, Perichov Gimel, and then the parallel in Divrei Yamim to figure out. In Divrei Yamim, it's not clear that Yoshio ever read anything. The reason why I chose this is because this is the, this, this parak has the king reading something, which then becomes the basis for the king reading. Then the king ordered Chilkiyo, the Kohen Gadol, and the Kohenei Mishnah, and the Shomrei Hasaf to remove all of the uh, Avodah Zarah, Baal, Asherah stuff. Okay. So, in fact, Rishonim point out, I, I gave you one example here, but there are numerous examples. This is the Urayim, um, who points out that, that this is where we get this detail that the king reads. So, the, the, the king piece of this seems to be not, ex- it's not explicit in the Torah. Um, it seems to be from this story of Yoshiahu. Now, the Yoshiahu story is like a little different than, it does have renewal of covenant stuff, but it also has this like tshuva overlay, you know, and, and, a, and a kind of national repentance project, which is not necessarily what Hakel sounds like in in, in Sefer Dvarim, um, but in that time, it seems like it functioned as this great gathering, you know. It's pretty close, though. I mean, yeah. If you're yeah. About yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, for sure. You know. Yeah, this has a little bit more of a Billy Graham revival, uh, <laughs> you know, feel to it than, than regular Hakel. Is that sacrilegious? I don't know. <laughs> no. I feel like I'm also old if like do people even know billy graham is i don't know okay yeah okay yeah so i it definitely has some of that um some of that and the, and the other example um in tanakh of like a, a a ceremony which sounds a whole lot like um hakel is 
the story in Nehemiah. And this seasonally is a little closer. It's not necessarily Sukkot, but it's at the beginning of, the, of Tishrei. Sounds like it's Rosh Hashanah. The Mivinim are the people who, who then will translate it to others. That's where the Mishnah gets the whole Bima, right? Where do we get that they erect some kind of platform? I think it's from this story. But there are translators, even though... In- uh, it has to be said in Hebrew, but it sounds like it's okay for it to be translated, right? Like Torah reading was done, you know, later with the with the targum. Um, this sounds like proto targum, also, by the way. This is like where the idea of targum, I think, is first cited. The idea of like there were people there who would help others understand. It's pretty close, though. Yeah. To Yoshua, because. The sense of they're coming back. To, yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't have a regular hakel ceremony attested to in, to in Tanakh, but we got two pretty close. Maybe with, that, that's what it means about seven years. Right. Yeah. Like, like every once in a while. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so then they have these people who who um, uh, who are alongside him apparently translating or explaining and Ezra opens up the safer before everybody this is the hag this is proto hagba also like shows them look at the book and vayvarcha Ezra tashemelo hayalokim agadol vayanu chol am amen amen bemoal yidei mayikdu vayishtachu la shema paim artsa okay and then there were the people who were explaining it etc um and then it goes on to talk about this is the first time they did sukkah ever it's like crazy you know like, literally since the time of Yoshua. It's like so weird. David and Shlomo, the people didn't do sukkahs? Like, they also did Hechag, so... Like, right. It's, it's not clear. It's, it's very unclear. Okay. So let's now turn. I, I want to make sure we, we spend a little time on this. Let's... I was just studying this last week, and their celebration of, quote, it's very different. To how yes, we yes. They, they make Sukkot out of Arba Minim. There's yeah. a lot of funky stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> no, that's fine. I quoted Billy Graham, you know, I, you know, we're. Just went to the exhibition when he walks Oh, oh, cool. Oh, that's very interesting. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So in researching this topic, this Tosefta, um, and especially uh, Shaul Lieberman's explication of the Tosefta, the Tosefta Kipshuta kind of opened up my eyes to, to a little bit of the, what's going on in the Mishnah that we already talked about that, that when, where's the Parshat HaMelech, what did they, exactly they read? And it really sets up two different sets of content for HaKel, and as a consequence, two different uh, emphases for the ceremony. And I think that that's worth kind of reflecting on. So here's the Tosefta. Um, so that's very similar to, to the language of the Mishnah. Notably, there's, there's no mention of Parshat HaMelech in that, in that listing, but it, it also doesn't have the Brachot Klalot. Um... That's the only thing that's left out, right? Yeah. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Lo hayet sarich lahatchil me rosh ha-sefer, el eshma v'hayim shamoa, aser taser, v'chi techalel la-aser, u-parshat ha-melech, ad shegomer et kula, u-parshiot ha-nidrashot ba, v'gomer ad sof. You do those parshiot, the last part you do is the portion of the king. You complete that along with 
I'm, I'm translating, this is my translation. Uparshiyot hanidrashot ba, the laws derive from it. We'll see why I say that in a little bit. The Gomer Arasof. And he completes it, meaning referring to the Parshat HaMelech until the end. As opposed to the Mishnah, where it sounds like it's till the end of the Bracha to Klod or till the end of Sefer Dvar. So here's Lieberman on this, on this Tosefta. B'Mishnah, Tenu Sof, Parag Zainu, Parshat HaMelech, Bracha Klod, Shikomar Klod, Figir Sazu, Choser L'Rosh, Achare Shekara, Ki Tchalel Aser, Koreyat Parshat HaMelech. Figir Sazu, Nigmarim Divrei Rabbi Yehuda, B'Dibor V'Chisa, Chalel Aser, V'Dvar V'Lu Mamar Muskar, so one way to read this is to say Rabbi Huda is just interjecting one comment about the, the, the starting point, but he's not commenting on the overall um, parshiot. But he says, Baram klal. V'chein hayita hagir slofnei Rashi, Rav Avadi Bartanura, Meiri, Tosot Ivra, etc. V'nididah mimakom l'makom hu siman muvhak lahosafa. And the fact that it's out of order is a good sign that it probably was a later edition. Ufizeh muchach shebim mishnatenu lo gar sukan parshat hamelech klal. V'chol hakriyal yedei hamelech nikret parshat hamelech. And the whole reading of by the king is called Parsha Melch. Ubin Israut Arigila no Safa U Parsha Melch Mina Tosefta Khan. Nimtenu Medim Shef Sharla Marsha Kriya be Parsha Melch Hibishita Rabihu de Greda Uberesha Khan Hi Piskak Tsara Mina Mishnah. So there are two different opinions here on the whole uh, list of readings as opposed to just an interjection. So I then, I, 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 it, it ended up being kind of on two pages, which I didn't intend, but you have below the Tosefta Kipshuta the two different portions of Hakel that were read. Okay? So let me just highlight a couple of differences and then um, we'll, we'll suggest potential um, differences. And, and what this is saying is, what, let me just telegraph what, what I think. Rabbi Yehuda's version of Hakel, I think, is the kind of original version of Hakel. It's the Agrippas version of Hakel because he has Parshat HaMelech in it. By the time you got to the Mishnah, the Mishnah no longer has Parshat HaMelech in it, but it still has this story from Agrippas. So it sounds like you have this, you know, hodgepodge of a Mishnah put together. And that's why the Mishnah is kind of hard to read. It, the Mishnah kind of conflates the different stages of development of, of um, Hakel and Rabbi Yehuda and the Tosefta is attesting to kind of a, an earlier version of Hakel. That's, I don't have 100% proof. Is the earlier version? I think because of the Agrippa story. Meaning, you think the Agrippa story is from the time of Agrippa? I don't know if it's from the time of Agrippa, but it's, it, it seems to be a legend which we have attested to in other very early sources suggesting that the kernel of that story is, is around. Again, I, this is not like 100% proof. I'm, I'm, I'm working backwards. But what I do think is, I think uh, Professor Lieberman is correct that there are two different things going on here. And that's interesting to me. And that's what I wanted to like, spend a couple of times just kind of mapping out. So according to Rabbi Huda. You have, a, you have a shorter ceremony. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you have like, a, a, it, it's a tighter type of thing because you're not reading from the beginning of Devarim all the way through Shema. You're starting just with Shema, six psukim. Then you're reading Vahayim Shamoa. Then you're doing Aser Taser, which is another eight psukim. Then you're doing the Vidui Maaser. And then you, you land with the Parsha Tamelech and the, you know, she gomer et kol et kula, u parshiot ha nidrashot bo, vigomer adasof. Okay. That's, that's reviewed. According to the Mishnah, you have a much kind of broader thing. You start from the beginning of Dvarim, Eila Dvarim asher diber Moshe al kol Yisrael be'var yardim ba'midbar ba'arava. You then do Shema v'hayim Shema v'aser taser ki t'chalel aser, and then you also conclude with the brachot uklalot, which Rabbi Huda doesn't have. 
So what is the what is the um, what's the difference between those two ceremonies, those two lists, and and as as a consequence, those two um, hakel ceremonies? Yeah, Sophia, what do you think? Um, the Mishnah one provides more of like a historical framing of where we've come from mm-hmm. and why we're doing this, as opposed to just jumping straight into. Um, into these meats vote in particular. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking that, you know, when I studied Masech uh, Pesachim, that you have this sense of, okay, here's the basic that you have to say, and everything around it is, you know, debatable. So it seems to be there's the... The core. Is, the core. The core that... That, that according to Rabbi Yehuda, what is the same, I think, is the core. And, and it may be what, okay, go ahead. No, no I was, yeah. that, the, according to the longer one, has the Sarah Hidib wrote in it. Yeah. And this, and the shorter one doesn't. Yeah. And you might think in the longer one, the Sarah Hidib wrote is the core, but maybe not. Okay. Yeah, there's more, definitely much more historical context and a lot more uh, of that. So to me, what, what's striking um, in the Rabbi Huda version is, is as opposed to like renewal of the covenant and rededicating and all those Harsinai stuff, it, to me, it, it really focuses on, and that's why I, I kind of did some selections in the left-hand column, it really focuses on the idea of everyone being subjected to and, and submitting to the yoke of heaven, right? You start with Shema, which we know from the mission in Brachot, Lama Kadma Shema, Kedeshi Kabel Alav O Malchut Shemaim Tchil Kabel Alav O Mitzvot. That's, that's, the, that's the first two parshiot. Aser Taser emphasizes Laman Tilmadli Yirat Hashem Elokecha Kol Ayamim. And again, remember, Yirat Hashem was a big focus in the Hakel. Um, and Vidui Mas, or Kechol Mitzvah Tcha, Asher Tzivitani Lo Avarti Mitzvah Tcha, Lo Shachachri, Shamati Bechol Hashem Elokai, Asiti Kechol Asher Tzivitani. And then the fact that you land with Parsha Melech. Think about it. The king reading the Parsha, which is all about the limits of the king's power. Parshat HaMelech is really the, the, the climax of HaKel, according to Rabbi Huda's version. And the idea seems to be that the person who's reading this, the most powerful person in all of Israel, is saying, I, I, I need to constantly recognize levilti rom rom levavo mechav levati sur mina mitzvah yaminu small laman yarich yamim al mamachto hu vana bekarav yisrael. According to Rabbi Yehuda, the the hakel ceremony seems to be much, you know, kind of really tightly tailored to make this particular point, which is all of us, mm-hmm. even the king, and especially the king, are subject to the Torah. And the mitzvot. It's like a, a, a kind of reminder. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a national ceremony of Shema, of Kabbalat O Malchut Shemayim, and the portions that are selected reflect that. And the, the landing, the sticking the landing with Parshan Melech really highlights that in, in I think, the, the, the fullest sense. And that's why, in according to Rabbi Huda, you even are Doresh, the Parshiot Hanidrasho, but like, you spend time on Parsha Melech. He doesn't just read Parsha Melech. He then goes through kind of the interpretation of Parsha Melech. What does it mean? I can't have this many horses. I can't have this many wives. I can't have this. I can't do that. I have to be careful about all these things. And I think it's almost like the king uh, uh, affirming that he too is subject to this. Um, I, I think that's it. Is more realistic. Uh, yeah, and I think the Mishnah shifts it and maybe goes back to like its original biblical roots too, more in the sense that it, it, the Mishnah and its more expansive 
Hakelin, including those sections of Dvarim, the Brachon and Klalot, and the Serata Dibrot, makes it a little bit more about this renewing of the covenant and rededicating of the covenant and, 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 and all that. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, if you turn to page four, oh, I got to wrap up. If you turn to page four, you'll see um, I mentioned that source number six is that is the is the people is the strand in Chazal that didn't approve of what Agrippus did, right? The Mishnah doesn't censure the Chachamim for praising Agrippus, but the Tosefta does. The Tosefta says, "Misham Ramnatan Amru Nitchayvu Yisrael Kliya Shechinfu Lagrippas Amalch." They they inappropriately flattered uh, Agrippas. It was Hanifa. And therefore, um, they were they were um, they, they they were determined to be to be destroyed. Yeah, so it's really deliberate, right? Also, what's interesting is the Mishnah doesn't mention explicitly that that Agrippus was reading what he was reading on um, at Hakel. It sounds like it yeah. because of where it's interjected, but the Medrash Tanaim says it explicitly. And it tells the same story of the mission. Okay, so I just want to just briefly highlight some, some strands and maybe suggest some other uh, food for thought. So I, I think if we're talking about the goals of Hakel and maybe its connection to Shemitah and Sukkot, just to kind of come back to where we started, Rabbi Huda emphasizes Kabbalah no Malchut of each individual, including the king. The Mishnah seems to emphasize reliving of past covenantal ceremonies and rededication of the covenant. The Rambam, which we didn't have time to talk to at all, really focuses on the idea of strengthening dat ha'emet, the true faith, and also recreating the, the Har Sinai experience. Um, and just then, uh, the Yerushalmi and Sota, which we didn't talk about, um, emphasizes the idea of this is the post Shemitah, going back to regular, regular work and, and balancing work and spiritual life. That's why they read Aser Ta Aser and Ki Techalela Aser, because those are like all about, okay, now we're going back and we got to tithe and we got to do everything else. Wait, they're starting that. That's right. The they're st- restarting that again in the eighth year. And um, I, I think Ezra and Nehemiah and uh, even the, the Tosefta, which um, which talks about um, being Doresh, the Parshiot, Achigomeret Kula, they, they highlight like another aspect that we didn't talk about, which is like a communal Talmud Torah experience. Um, right? That's, that's like the Midrash Rabban Kohelet that says that Kohelet was the, the, these were the, the Dvarim Namarim Bahakel that, that um, Shlomo, when he gathered the people. Uh, and then lastly, and this I'm going to spend more time on in my shul when I talk about, about this on Shabbat Shuvah, clearly from Yoshiahu and even from the Nehe- Ezra Nehemia story, there is a tshuva component to, to, um, to Hakel. And that, if you look, there's an, a, an amazing kliyakar who ties this into Sukkot and post and everything else. And he's like, Sukkot is the time that everyone gathers together and tshuva is really only possible when we're gathered together and when we're all as one. And the Hakel ceremony was really about kind of recharging the nation uh, on, on the tshuva front. So I, I hope in this hour we've, um, we've, we've uh, raised some of my, what I think are really interesting um, elements of Hakel, and, and for me, as we're, put, we're, we, we're just renovating and hopefully moving into our new shul, like all these pieces are in my head of like, how do we build community? How do we kind of properly celebrate this particular milestone? And how do we give it um, life uh, to, to last us for the next seven years and beyond? Thanks, guys.